It's a pleasure to introduce the two authors and my distinguished commentator. Let me tell you a little bit about them. John Mearsheimer is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science and the co-director of the Program on International Security Policy at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 1982. He graduated from West Point in 1970 and then served five years as an officer in the U.S. Air Force. He then started graduate school having decided without wanting to be a professor that he really wanted a PhD. Graduate school in political science at Cornell University in 1975 and received his PhD five years later. He has had a number of very important positions and has been a member of important institutions of debate and policy in this country. He has been a research fellow at the Brookings Institution, a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Center for International Affairs, the Whitney Shepherdson Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, and in 2003, he was given the honor of election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Mearsheimer has written extensively on security issues and international politics in general. He's published a number of books, including Conventional Deterrence, which won the Edgar Furness Book Award, Liddell Hart and the Weight of History, and The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, which won the Joseph Lepgold Book Prize. His co-author co and my former colleague from Harvard, Stephen Walt, is the Robert and Renee Belfer Professor of International Affairs. He holds a BA in International Relations from Stanford University and an MA and PhD in Political Science from the University of California at Berkeley. He was previously on our faculty in the 1980s and at the University of Chicago, where he served as Deputy Dean of the Social Sciences. He, too, is the author of a number of award-winning books, including The Origins of Alliances, which received the Furness Book Award uh, for National Security Studies in 1988, Revolution and War, and Taming American Power, the Global Response to U.S. Primacy. Steve Walt has been a resident associate of the Carnegie Endowment for Peace and a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution and a consultant for the Institute of Defense Analysis, the Center for Naval Analysis, and the National Defense University. He serves on many editorial boards, which place him uh, in an important position with respect to his field of expertise in foreign policy, security studies, and international relations. In addition to the book we'll be talking about tonight, his recent publications include An Unnecessary War, Beyond Bin Laden, Reshaping U.S. Foreign Policy, and The Enduring Relevance of the Realist Tradition. I'm also very pleased to introduce my colleague, Robert Cohane, Professor of International Affairs here at Princeton University. And I hope that we will make it a habit in these book forums to introduce and request that one of our own colleagues deliver uh, thoughtful remarks about the books in question, because after all, this is a dialogue between authors and Princeton, the Princeton community itself. And I couldn't ask for a more distinguished or valuable colleague than this one uh, for this purpose this evening. Bob is the author, author of After Hegemony, Cooperation and Discord in the World Political Economy, Power and Governance in a Partially Globalized World, and the co-author of Power and Interdependence. Most recently, with Peter Katzenstein, he framed the debate on the political importance of anti-Americanism in an edited volume entitled Anti-Americanism in World Politics, and that is an especially important reason for him, I think, to be commenting on the book this evening. Bob has served as the editor of International Organization, the president of the International Studies Association, and the American Political Science Association. He has won numerous awards for his work in international relations and is also a member of the, Academy, uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the National Academy of Sciences. I'm really delighted to introduce both the authors and our commentator this evening and to welcome all of you on behalf of peers and our co-sponsoring institutions and in the name of important debate about critical ideas in our society. So let me turn it over to the team. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that welcome. I want to thank Catherine for the very kind introduction and to the various organizations at Princeton uh, that have invited us here. It is wonderful for me actually to be back here. Uh, indeed, I taught my very first class, Politics 240, in this very room in 1984. It wasn't quite as full <laughs> in those days. Uh, we're going to talk about two main questions today. First, is there a powerful pro-Israel lobby in the United States? And if so, how does it work? And second, on balance, is its influence positive or negative for the United States, but also for Israel? Now, I'm going to address the first question, and John is going to tackle the second. But before I get started, I want to acknowledge how difficult it can be to raise this subject and why it has to be handled with some sensitivity. If we were here today to talk about America's energy policy, you wouldn't think it surprising if I talked about the political activities of American oil companies. If I were talking about gun control, or perhaps the lack of gun control, it would hardly be controversial for me to bring up the role of the National Rifle Association. If I were talking about American policy towards Cuba, you wouldn't find it surprising if I mentioned the role of Cuban Americans and some of their lobbying groups. But when the subject is Middle East policy and you bring up the Israel lobby, you're reaching out and grabbing the third rail with both hands. Now that's partly because some of the groups in the lobby are quick to attack anyone who questions the policies that they're advocating. But it's also because this entire conversation takes place in the shadow of centuries of anti-Semitism, which includes bizarre conspiracy theories like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and of course tragic events like the Holocaust, and that history shapes how we all think and talk about these events. So if you talk about a powerful interest group that is mostly though by no means exclusively comprised of Jewish Americans, some may think you're saying that there's a secret conspiracy to control American foreign policy. If you say that media coverage in the United States tends to favor Israel, it sounds to some people like you're making the old charge that Jews control the media. If you talk about campaign contributions by pro-Israel PACs, some people will accuse you of saying that Jewish money is doing something improper. I want to be clear at the outset that John and I both reject every one of those various anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. To us, the Israel lobby is just an interest group, like lots of other interest groups in the United States. Most of its activities are entirely appropriate forms of democratic politics. We don't question Israel's legitimacy or its right to exist. In fact, we think the United States should come to Israel's aid if its survival is ever in jeopardy. But we also think that the activities of the lobby and its impact on U.S. foreign policy are subjects that people ought to be able to talk about openly and reasonably the same way we discuss any other groups that try to influence American policy, either foreign or domestic. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the special relationship. Israel is the largest recipient of U.S. economic and military aid. It gets about $500 per year for each Israeli citizen even though its per capita income is now 29th in the world. It's not a poor country like Burundi or Bangladesh. And it gets this aid even when it does things the United States opposes, like building settlements in the West Bank. Israel gets consistent diplomatic support from the United States, for example, in the United Nations. And we almost always take its side in regional disputes. Israel is rarely, if ever, criticized by US officials and certainly not by anyone who aspires to high office in the United States. All you have to do is look at the current presidential campaign where every major candidate seems to be competing to show how personally devoted he or she is to Israel. And the question is why? Now the usual answer is that Israel is a vital strategic asset and a country that shares American values. But if you step back and look at those two rationales, they can't explain why we give so much help and give it with so few strings. Israel may have been a strategic asset during the Cold War, but the Cold War is now over. Today, giving Israel nearly unconditional support is one of the reasons we have a terrorism problem, not the only one, but one of them. And it makes it harder, not easier, to address a number of other problems in the Middle East. True, the United States does benefit from some forms of strategic cooperation with Israel, but it's hard to argue that unconditional backing is making the United States more popular around the world or making American citizens more secure here at home. On balance, the special relationship is now a strategic liability. 
As for the claim that Israel is a democracy that shares our values, yes, it's a vibrant democracy, but so are lots of other states, and none of them gets anywhere near as much support. Plus, Israel's treatment of its own Arab citizens, and especially its Palestinian subjects, is sharply at odds with American values and Western standards of human rights. Nor is Israel's behavior significantly better than that of the Palestinians. I don't have time to go into details here, but any reasonably fair-minded look at the history of the region, including more recent histories written by Israeli historians, shows that both sides on this, of this conflict have done many cruel things to each other, and neither side owns the moral high ground here. Please note, I am not saying that Israel acts worse than other countries do, only that it hasn't acted better. And so you can't justify unconditional American support by saying that its conduct is somehow exemplary. I want to emphasize again, we think there is a strong moral case for Israel's existence based on the long history of anti-Semitism. And we think the United States should come to Israel's aid if its survival is at risk. But its existence is fortunately not in jeopardy today, and past crimes against the Jewish people do not justify a blank check now. So what explains its privileged position? In our view, it's primarily the Israel lobby. The lobby is a loose coalition of individuals and groups who work openly to influence U.S. foreign policy in a pro-Israel direction and maintain the special relationship. It includes organizations like APAC, the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, Christians United for Israel, think tanks like the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, publications like the Weekly Standard, Commentary, or the New Republic. Now, that's a broad definition but if you think about it, many interest groups have lots of different components to them. The environmental movement in the United States isn't just Greenpeace or the Sierra Club. It also includes research organizations, sympathetic journalists, academics who work on topics like global warming. Or think of the arms control community, which has lots of different organizations and lots of different individuals involved in it. The Israel lobby is not a centralized organization. And the groups that comprise it do not agree on every single issue. It is certainly not a cabal or a conspiracy to control American foreign policy. Rather, it's just another interest group, like many others. Its actions, we like to say, are as American as apple pie. Final important point here. The lobby is not synonymous with Jewish Americans. Surveys suggest that about a quarter of Jewish Americans don't care one way or the other about Israel very much. Many others do not support the positions of the key organizations in the lobby, and some of the groups that work on Israel's behalf, such as the so-called Christian Zionists, aren't Jewish. The lobby is defined by the political agenda it favors, not by ethnicity and not by religion. And the key to that political agenda is preserving the special relationship. So how does it work? Well, in American politics, relatively small groups with a focused agenda often wield disproportionate influence because they care a lot about a single issue and politicians can win their support without losing anyone else's. Think of the farm lobby or the National Rifle Association. And like other special interest groups, the Israel lobby works in two main ways. First, it exercises influence inside the Beltway by getting sympathetic people elected to office or appointed to key positions in the government, and by giving politicians obvious incentives to support the positions the lobby is in favor of. Organizations like APAC work 24-7 to convince politicians to support their program. APAC, by the way, has an annual budget of about $50 million. It's very active on Capitol Hill, helping draft legislation, providing talking points for congressmen, writing letters for them to sign. It's a highly professional organization with a very energetic and active grassroots base. APAC is not a political action committee, however, and it doesn't give money directly to politicians. Instead, it helps guide campaign contributions from individuals and pro-Israel political action committees that do give money directly. For example, it interviews every candidate running for Congress and asks them to write a position paper laying out their views on the Middle East so that it can then advise PACs on who to give the money to. Those pro-Israel PACs, and there are about three dozen of them uh, currently active, have given about $55 million in the last 15 years to various political candidates. That's not counting individual contributions, by the way. 
Uh, by comparison, Arab American political action committees, of which there are a handful, gave about $800,000 over that same 15-year period. So you get a rough idea of the balance of support. And over the past 30 years, APAC and other groups have helped drive a number of prominent politicians from office so that every congressman and every presidential candidate knows you are playing with fire if you question American support for Israel. This is all to explain why Steve Rosen, the APAC official who is now under indictment for passing classified information, once put a napkin in front of a journalist from The New Yorker and said in 24 hours we could have the signatures of 70 senators on this napkin. APAC was ranked the second most powerful lobby in Washington in a 2003 survey of congressmen and their staffs conducted by the National Journal. By the way, it was tied with the AARP. It was also ranked second in a similar survey conducted uh, by Fortune magazine in 1997. Bill Clinton said APAC was, quote, better than anyone else lobbying in this town. And Newt Gingrich called it, quote, the most effective general interest group across the entire planet. Former Congressman Lee Hamilton, who served in Congress for 34 years, said there's no group that matches it. They're in a class by themselves. Former Senator Fritz Hollings said, as he was leaving office, you can't have an Israel policy other than what AIPAC gives you. And the late Senator Barry Goldwater, who was himself half Jewish, said he never faced greater pressure than from the Israel lobby and, quote, it's the most influential crowd in Congress by far. It is not surprising that Prime Minister Ehud Olmert said just last year, thank God we have APAC, the greatest supporter and friend we have in the whole world. And one wonders why our book was regarded as controversial, given that we were just elaborating on what Washington insiders already understood quite well. And again, it's not just APAC. Uh, it's also a number of other groups and individuals and a whole subset of the Christian evangelical movement. All right, the second strategy, that's the first strategy. The second strategy is to try and shape public discourse and perception so that Israel is viewed favorably by most Americans. Uh, mainstream media in the United States tends to be pro-Israel, especially in editorial commentary and in terms of op-ed columnists and pundits. If you compare coverage in the United States to either Europe or Israel, you simply find a much narrower range of views in mainstream media here. For example, if you look at columnists in the United States, there's simply no equivalent of a Robert Fisk or a Patrick Seal, who write in England, or no equivalent of Akiva Elder, Bradley Burston, Gideon Levy, or Amira Haas, who write in Israel. My point, by the way, is not that voices like theirs are always right and that pro-Israel pundits are always wrong. My point is that voices like theirs, who are often sharply critical of Israeli policy, are largely absent from mainstream media here in the United States. But even so, watchdog groups like the Anti-Defamation League monitor media coverage, organize boycotts and demonstrations against news agencies that publish anything critical of Israel, and groups like Campus Watch monitor activities on campus and put pressure on universities. So when Jimmy Carter published his book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, the ADL took out ads in major newspapers, which included the publisher's phone number, and invited readers to call in and protest publication of the book. This past fall, when CNN broadcast a three-part series comparing Jewish, Muslim, and Christian fundamentalism, the Jewish newspaper Forward reported that CNN was coming under unprecedented attack for the broadcast, and the Forward also reported that the Conference of Presidents was urging its member organizations to take up the issue with any companies that had bought advertising time for the program. The purpose, of course, is to remind CNN not to do things like this in the future. Finally, efforts to limit criticism nearly always include smearing critics by accusing them of being anti-Semitic. Martin Peretz, the editor of The New Republic, wrote that Jimmy Carter, quote, will go down in history as a Jew hater. Another critic wrote in the Washington Post that Carter's views were very similar to those of David Duke, the former head of the Ku Klux Klan, and the pro-Israel New York Sun published an article suggesting Carter was sympathetic to Nazi war criminals. This is a remarkable way to treat the man who negotiated the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty and therefore did more for Israeli security than virtually any other American president. 
Needless to say, accusations of anti-Semitism were a common charge leveled at us, even though there is not the slightest shred of evidence to support the charge. If you read our book, you will find nothing remotely anti-Semitic about it. In fact, what you'll find are explicit condemnations of anti-Semitism and explicit statements reaffirming Israel's right to exist. Smearing people with this charge is done for three reasons. First, it distracts people from the real issue, which is American policy. Second, it deters potential critics from speaking out, because who wants to be labeled an anti-Semite? And finally, it marginalizes people in the public arena. Would any politician want to associate with someone who had been charged, even falsely, with being an anti-Semite? And that's why people in the foreign policy mainstream rarely say anything critical of Israel, because they know it could damage their careers. Just this year, Barack Obama was criticized for having Zbigniew Brzezinski as an advisor. And what had Brzezinski done wrong? He'd written a short article praising our original article about the Israel lobby. That was the charge leveled at Brzezinski. It's hard to imagine that this doesn't have a chilling effect on other people in the community. Bottom line, of course, is that there's very little serious debate about American support for Israel, especially in Congress, but also more broadly, even at a moment in history where it's obvious to virtually everybody that American Middle East policy has gone badly off the rails. All right, I want to make one last point, and then I will turn this over to John. It is sometimes said that the United States backs Israel not because of the Israel lobby, but because there's broad public support for Israel, that politicians are just doing what the public wants. This argument is not persuasive for a couple of reasons. Well, it's true that Americans do have a generally favorable image of Israel. That's it, partly because media coverage tends to be favorable, but not entirely that. Um, but they don't think the United States should be giving Israel unconditional or one-sided aid. A survey conducted by the Anti-Defamation League in 2005 found that 78% of Americans think the United States should favor neither side in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A poll by the University of Maryland in 2003 found that over 70% of politically active Americans favored cutting aid to Israel if it refused to settle the conflict. So Americans do have a generally favorable image of Israel. They want it to exist. They want it to be secure just like John and I do, but they're not insisting that we back Israel no matter what. But that's pretty much what American policy has been, and the gap between what the American people really want and what our policy is, is due mostly to the political influence of the various groups in the Israel lobby. So the question now is, is the lobby's influence positive or negative? That's an easy question, so I'll leave it for John. Thank you very much. <laughs> Steve has defined the lobby and made the case that it has a powerful influence on U.S. Middle East policy. I'd like to take the analysis a step further and argue that its influence has been largely negative. In a nutshell, our argument is that the lobby, working with Israel itself, has pushed U.S. Middle East policy in ways that are not in the American national interest, and I might add, not in Israel's interest either. I'm going to focus on one case, the role of the lobby and Israel in the run-up to the Iraq War. There are four other cases that we, dis we discuss in the book uh, that I won't deal with here because of time constraints, but we can surely talk about in the Q&A period. And those four cases are how U.S. support for Israel's brutal policies towards the Palestinians helps fuel our terrorism problem, American policy towards Syria, American policy towards Iran, and American policy during the Lebanon War in the summer of 2006. It's manifestly clear to most Americans at this point in time that the Iraq War is one of the greatest strategic blunders in U.S. history. Our argument is that Israel, and especially the lobby, were two of the main driving forces behind the decision to invade Iraq. We argue that it's hard to imagine that war happening in their absence. Now, this argument 
is obviously a controversial one, but we are hardly alone in making it. Indeed, a number of prominent individuals who fit squarely in the American political mainstream have made essentially the same argument. For example, Philip Zelico, who was the executive director of the 9-11 Commission, and more recently, counselor to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, told the University of Virginia audience on September 10th, 2002, that Saddam was not a direct threat to the United States. The real threat, he argued, is the threat against Israel. He went on to say, and this is the threat that dare not speak its name, because the Europeans don't care deeply about that threat, and the American government doesn't want to lean too hard on it rhetorically, because it's not a popular sell. A few weeks before the United States invaded Iraq, the journalist Joe Klein wrote in Time magazine, a stronger Israel is very much embedded in the rationale for war with Iraq. It is part of the argument that dare not speak its name, a fantasy quietly cherished by the neoconservative faction in the Bush administration and by many leaders of the American Jewish community. General Wesley Clark, the retired NATO commando and former presidential candidate said in August 2002 that, quote, those who favor this attack now will tell you candidly and privately that it is probably true that Saddam Hussein is no threat to the United States, but they are afraid that at some point he might decide, if he had a nuclear weapon, to use it against Israel. Former Senator Ernest Hollings, made a similar argument in May 2004. After noting that Iraq was not a direct threat to the United States, he asked why we invaded that country. The answer, which he said everyone knows, is because we want to secure our friend Israel. The journalist Robert Novak referred to the war well before it happened as Sharon's war and continues to do so today. I am convinced, he said in April 2007, that Israel made a large contribution to the decision to embark on this war. I know that on the eve of the war, Sharon said in a closed conversation with senators that if they could succeed in getting rid of Saddam Hussein, it would solve Israel's security problems. Finally, when the prospect of an American invasion was beginning to dominate the headlines in the fall of 2002, the journalist Michael Kinsley wrote that the lack of public discussion about the role of Israel is the proverbial elephant in the room. Everybody sees it, no one mentions it. The reason for this reluctance, he observed, was fear of being labeled an anti-Semite. Of course, these statements are not evidence that Israel and the lobby played a key role in causing the Iraq war. So let's look at the evidence. To start with Israel, it was the only country besides Kuwait where both the government and a majority of the population favored the war. The Israeli government, to include Prime Minister Sharon, pushed the Bush administration hard to make sure that it did not lose its nerve in the months before the invasion. Other influential Israelis, like former Prime Ministers Ehud Barak and Benjamin Netanyahu, also implored the United States to take down Saddam. In fact, Israel was pushing so hard for war that its allies in the United States warned Israeli officials to damp down their rhetoric lest it be seen as a war for Israel. I might add that President Clinton said in 2006 that every Israeli politician I knew thought that Saddam was so great a threat that he should be removed even if he did not have WMD. The Israeli public was also solidly behind the war. According to a February 2003 poll, that's one month before the war began, 77.5% of Israelis said that they wanted the United States to attack Iraq. 
This is why Benjamin Netanyahu told a congressional committee in September 2002 that, I reflect the sentiment of not just the majority, but the overwhelming majority of Israelis in supporting a preemptive attack against Saddam's regime. And this cuts across political lines in Israel. One sometimes hears the argument, and I'm sure many of you have, that Israel opposed the Iraq war and actually favored attacking Iran instead. There's no question that in early 2002, when the Israelis first got wind that the Bush administration was thinking about attacking Iraq, key Israeli officials went to Washington and made it clear that they thought that the greater enemy was Iran and that the Bush administration should focus on Tehran, not on Baghdad. It's important to emphasize, however, that Israel was not opposed to the United States toppling the regimes in Iraq or Syria, two countries that Jerusalem <coughs> considers mortal enemies. Israel simply wanted the United States to deal with Iran first. But once the Israelis realized that the war party intended to deal with Iran after it finished the job in Iraq, it enthusiastically embraced the idea of invading Iraq. Thus, between early 2002 and March 2003, the Israelis put significant pressure on the Bush administration to make sure it chose war over diplomacy with Iraq while reminding Washington not to forget that Iran must come after Iraq. I might add that there is no evidence that Israel warned the United States that Iraq would turn into a quagmire. Indeed, the Israelis thought that Iraq would be a cakewalk, which is why they were confident that the Bush administration would be free to go after Iran right after the mission was accomplished in Iraq. Of course, they were wrong. Turning now to the lobby, there is no question that the neoconservatives, one of the core constituencies in the lobby, were the main driving force behind the war. But they were supported by key organizations in the lobby like APEC. Now that the war has gone south, it's common to hear Israel's supporters here in the United States say that the main organizations in the lobby did not push for war. But that is not true. This point is made clear in a May 2003 editorial that appeared in The Forward, a weekly Jewish newspaper based in New York. The editorial reads, most major organizations have wisely opted to follow Sharon's lead and lay low, but their top leaders and donors have strong views. The most audible voices are pro-war and they're making themselves heard on op-ed pages, in phone calls to lawmakers, and across the internet. It's true that America's six million Jews are divided on the war like other Americans, but the organized Jewish community tilts heavily toward war. And as Jewish leaders like to remind themselves, the views of the community carry some weight in this country. To drive the point home, Consider an editorial that appeared in the same paper, The Forward, a year later. It reads, as President Bush attempted to sell the war in Iraq, America's most important Jewish organizations rallied as one to his defense. In statement after statement, community leaders stressed the need to rid the world of Saddam Hussein and his weapons of mass destruction. Concern for Israel's security rightfully factored in to the deliberations of the main Jewish groups. One sometimes hears the claim these days that APEC took no position on the Iraq war and certainly did not advocate it. This is not true either. 
First of all, this claim fails the common sense test, as APEC usually supports what Israel wants, and Israel certainly wanted a war against Iraq. Second, there is hard evidence that APEC lobbied for the war. For example, APEC's executive director, Howard Kaur, told the New York Sun in January 2003 that one of APEC's successes over the past year was, quote, quietly lobbying Congress to approve the use of force in Iraq, end of quote. The neoconservatives, of course, were the main driving force behind the war. They initiated the idea of using force to topple Saddam in two letters written to President Clinton in early 1998. Over the next five years, and especially after 9-11, they pushed relentlessly for a war against Iraq. No other group or institution in the United States was seriously committed to invading Iraq over that five-year period. Indeed, there was significant opposition to attacking Iraq, even after 9-11, within the State Department, the intelligence community, and the uniformed military. I might add that there is hardly any evidence that the oil companies or the oil producing states were pushing for war with Iraq. The neoconservatives are, by their own admission, deeply committed to Israel. In fact, many of them are connected with key organizations in the lobby, like the American Enterprise Institute and the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Our argument here, it should be emphasized, is not that the neoconservatives or the leaders of the principal organizations in the lobby were pushing a war that was in Israel's interest but not in America's national interest. On the contrary, the neoconservatives believed that invading Iraq was in both the American and Israeli national interests. For the neoconservatives, what is good for Israel is good for the United States and vice versa. Although the neoconservatives were deeply committed to a war with Iraq, they could not make it happen by themselves. They failed to convince Clinton to go to Baghdad, and they had little luck selling the war in the first eight months of the Bush administration. It was the events of 9-11 that created the circumstances where they could help convince both President Bush and Vice President Cheney that invading Iraq was a smart idea. The neoconservatives had, in Robert Kagan's words, a ready-made approach to the world at a time when both the president and the vice president were trying to make sense of an unprecedented disaster that seemed to call for radically new ways of thinking about international politics. Nevertheless, it's important to emphasize that without Bush and Cheney on board, there would not have been a war. They bear the ultimate responsibility for the decision to invade Iraq. I might add that Steve and I believe that the United States would probably not have gone to war against Iraq had Al Gore been elected president in 2000. All of this is to say that the neoconservatives were necessary to have the war, but by themselves they could not make it happen. It's worth noting.